are listening to Setting History Straight with Linda Watson on Hebrew Nation Radio. Okay, so this program is going to be on Abraham's promises. And so what was it that Abraham was promised? So we're going to cover that today. So we know that it talks about how Abraham, his descendants were to be like the stars in the heavens. They would be so many descendants, they would be like the stars in the heavens. So we're going to talk about that. Now, let's just go through this, go through a little bit more detail on the story of Lot and Abraham. So uh, I think there's some things that we've missed. We that the New Testament comes back and really defines and tells us. So we're going to go through this. And all right, so let's go ahead and get started here. This is the story of Lot and Abraham. And we're going to store it in Genesis 13, verse 7. And, and there was a strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's cattle and Lot's cattle. And and he verse 8, and Abraham said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee between me and thee because abraham was a peacemaker do y'all see that he he was a peacemaker and scripture talks specifically to people that are peacemakers and between my herdsmen and thy herdsmen for we are brothers okay verse nine is not the whole land before thee separate thyself and pray thee for me if thou will take the left hand then i will take the right or, and and then he says vice versa. So he said, you pick, you pick. You either take the right side because we have a lot of land and I'll take the left side. So verse 10, and Lot lifted up his eyes and behold all the plains of the Jordan, which were well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as they come to Zor. So around Zor is somewhere where he, he went in. And we're told that the city of Zor was a city of, of palm trees, which is another significant thing in scripture. <laughs> Going on in verse 13, 13, chapter 13, verse 11, and Lot chose him all the plains of the Jordan and Lot journeyed east. Now make sure that you pay attention to what this is saying because he went east he went east and and i separate thyself from the others so when abraham told him when you go east or west i'm going to go the opposite direction so we can separate ourselves so that would have put abraham where in the west okay so going on so you can see this map here so lot went on the east side his pastures were on the east side. Abraham's pastures in Cana were on the west side. Can y'all see that? Now watch, I'm going to talk about this. Now it's that is a parallel to what happened really and truly in this world because the Christian nations went west and, and Lot and his descendants basically went east. And we're going to talk about what that means, okay? But if I was to take and divide the world down the middle, then on the west side of the Western world, you would have the Christian nations. And on the Eastern side, you have Buddha, Hindus, and all the other different things that don't believe in the Messiah. Do y'all understand? One side does, one side doesn't. All right, now, uh, I'm going to turn this part over to Adam to explain. Galatians 4, verse 22. Adam? So um, this actually corresponds best with Genesis 15. Uh, but I think the point here, when we go through it, uh, Paul is trying to tell us that Abraham's two sons, uh, one with Hagar, one with Sarah, is, is an allegory. It's a symbolism of what's actually going to be happening with his descendants and the two covenants. And so when we get into uh, uh, 
Genesis 15, you need to have this scripture in mind. So let's just go over and read real quick. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. And there's this difference between the flesh and the promise throughout Paul's uh, writings. He also gets on this same topic in Romans 9. I'd encourage you to go check it out. Uh, we're not going to cover it in this. I don't think we're going to cover that in this uh, teaching, but he does talk about the difference between the children of the flesh and the children of promise. Uh, now, anyways, keep going here. He says, look, these are an allegory for these are the two covenants, the first and the second, what we call the old and the new covenant, right? The new covenants in Messiah as the mediator there, the old covenant under Moses. And he, he's very clear that he distinguishes exactly which one is uh, of Hagar. And here it says Agar instead of Hagar. But it says the one from Mount Sinai, which gender is to bondage, that's the one from Hagar. So the, the symbolism here in Genesis 15, which we'll get to, is, is you need to understand this, this symbolism when you're reading that chapter and also the next chapter. But anyway, he goes on to say, Hagar represents Mount Sinai in Arabia. So he's actually being geographically minded too. He's talking about a people, a time frame, and also a geography. That's why he said in Arabia, as in the Middle East, as in he's clarifying that one is uh, uh, the, the first, uh, Hagar's son corresponds to uh, the first covenant, which was in the Middle East. And of course, then he distinguished it from the second, which is, but the one that we answer, and that's the one they answer to uh, at that time when he was writing that, but we answer to the Jerusalem, which is from above, which is free, and the mother of us all. So I think just the point I want to make here is you have to understand uh, Abraham's, uh, the story of his, uh, his effort to have an heir uh, in light of what Paul is informing us uh, about right here. He's trying to tell us what it was really, what symbolism and what prophetic nature was in that story in Genesis 15. Yes, yes. And so this is also, I see this as in another way also, another another thought on this is that there was two promised lands. And one, the first one was the the former, which is the one that was in the Middle East. And then there was the one that was the latter, which is in this country. And so, you yeah, know, I think you, yep. you can, I actually see that go, that being talked about and discussed right here too, because there was two separate covenants, I believe. And I know not everybody agrees with me, but the first covenant was with Moses. And I think the second covenant is our constitution. And, you know, I, I, I look at that because I really see how they use the scriptures to, to build a government. They use the scriptures to build an actual government. And so it's, he said the second covenant that's talked about in Jeremiah 31, he specifically says it is not like the covenant of Moses. It was not like the covenant I gave Moses. So I, I can actually see it from what I'm trying to explain here that he is talking about two different covenants. And I, I believe that he's talking about our constitution as being the second. one. Now, I know that's I'm taking a little lean, leeway here, but I think we can build that case as we go through. Oh, thank you, Adam. All right. So mm -hmm. uh, this is the next piece. If you want to go over this. Yeah, we can, we, yeah we, we can go ahead. I mean, yeah. So he elaborates on. This whole analogy for is written, rejoice thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now, I, I'm going to stop here and just, I'm going to pause it here. Uh, the barren is making reference to that woman that we keep referencing that she's going to eventually give birth to a nation, right? And, that, yes. and, and the scripture indicates that this happens right before she has to flee into the wilderness. She gives birth to that nation. Um, I also think she gives birth to a king because uh, it says a man child is born and taken up into heaven. That's a side note, but it's something, there's a lot of scripture that talk about this and we've covered them uh, ad nauseum. 
but it also and so it's making reference what we believe is to that it's talking about he, thou that travailest not well until she does travail right and that's that's what we've read a lot of scriptures talking about at the time that she travails is when her pain is going to come after she's given birth so she's been she's been barren up to this point but uh, it's in my i wholeheartedly believe it's underway now but that a spiritual nation of believers is going to be born the likes of which we've never seen in this country and it's going to happen this year that's what i believe at this point uh, but also it says for the desolate hath many more why does it call the desolate because that's what's about to happen to babylon babylon is about to be made desolate right uh, you can go back to jeremiah 50 i think it's around verse 12 he says that the hindermost of the nations uh, which is the last in time that's what that word hindermost means that that it will become a, a wilderness a dry place and a desert and i think it also says it should be made desolate in several yes. places in jeremiah that talked about it so i'm quite sure that's what this is referencing uh, contrasting the two <clears throat> uh, I, we can we can move move on for the sake of okay to the All other right. point so um all right, so that's great. So thank you very much. I think that explains a, a lot here. And remember, the barren woman is the one that's talked about in Isaiah 54. It says, open up your tents, O barren woman, because you're going to have children. And uh, so he's really talking about a spiritual revival that, that takes place. And, and, and we won't even ha have to know that it happens because... You know, the Father is working with people all over the country and the world. And so we won't really have to know that it's actually happening, but I think he's going to do it. And so it, it talks about how he gives birth, the, the woman gives birth, her pains come be, uh, after she gives birth, which, you know, this that's talking basically about a nation being born, I believe, too. So now we're going to get to Genesis 15. This is what Adam was making reference to, but there's a lot in here that we want to cover. And so this is the only place that I found in scripture that talks about Abraham having a vision. I searched for the word vision and I didn't find it anywhere else. So as far as I know, that's the only place is in this chapter that he had a vision. And after these things, the word of Yah came unto Abraham in a vision. Now, a vision is different than a dream because he's actually going to have a conversation with the father in this vision. And you're going to see that saying, fear not Abraham, for I am thy shield and thy exceeding great will reward. So he's going to give him a reward, he says. And Abraham says to the father, what will thy Give me, seeing I'm childless. And, and he goes on, verse thir three. And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is my, is my heir. So he's referencing Ishmael here. He's referencing Ishmael. That, you know, well, I do have a child, but, you know, I um I haven't, he's not my heir through Sarah. And that's what he's really saying explaining to the father and behold the word came unto me saying this shall not be thy heir but he that shall come forth out of the, thy bowels shall be thy heir so he's referencing here isaac now verse 15 verse 5 and he brought him forth abroad and said look now toward heaven and toward the and tell the stars if thou will be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. So when I read this verse, and I think the translators that were translating use the word abroad here, is it may be possible that, and I don't know that for a fact, that he brought Abraham to this land in a vision, but he may not have. But he did give him a vision that the New Testament talks about. And it says, "You, hmm. I saw your day, and and he was Abraham saw your day, and he was glad." Now he was the Messiah was talking to the Pharisees at that point, 
So I think he showed Abraham quite a few things that was going to happen in the future. But the reference of saying, look, go outside, look at the stars, and that's what your descendants are going to be. Do you, everybody knows that we have 360 million people in this country. And if you were to go out and look at the stars, that's what it would look like. That's what it would look like. 360 million people looking up at that stars. That's what it would look like. So in, in a way, he's really referencing the that America, I believe, he's in this is one example of him pulling in a reference to America here because she she would have been the only place that would have had that many people in it. Do y'all understand that? That were of the tribes of Israel. Because in the Middle East, they did not have those large numbers. Now, when they started out, they they were in the millions, yes. And, and we know that David could put a million men on the battlefield. So there, there was large numbers around the time of David and Solomon, but not not anything like 360 million that we have here. Now I realize not everybody in this country is is of the seed of Abraham, but still that's a, a huge amount of people. And I think this is what it's referencing. And it's also just not just referencing it. It's, it's also a little prophecy playing out in this scripture right here also where he says, if thou will be able to number them, and he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. So I think at this point, there's a strong possibility that Abraham may have actually had a vision and see this country. Now, I know that's a little bit of a stretch, but I think it's very much possible that he saw that in a vision. And he believed in Yah, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So he believed in Yah. So he, his belief, his trust that he had for, for the Father, the Father counted to him as righteousness. So, you know, we talked about that last week with Terry and Neil, and they read those verses to us about, you know, your intent of your heart. And so this is the same principle here that, you know, you, the intention of your heart gives you it, the father views you as righteous okay now we're getting to 15 verse 8 uh anybody want to make a comment i haven't paused long um, enough for y'all to comment linda uh, i want to point out that the re we're going to get to it if you go you're going to cover the whole chapter or yeah, i am are uh -huh. you going to go all you are okay good because verse 16 necessarily tells us that Abram uh, was in the land that was given to the first covenant, uh, Israel. Right. It will allow, it will show us that. And so what, what that means is that's where he was at at the time of this vision, because he's, you know, we're going to cover that. But so I just want to point out that when it says go abroad, go outside of from where they were at, uh, necessarily means it was not the place of the first covenant land promise. So yes, verse eight, and he said, Yah, where, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit? So how do I know that I'm really going to inherit and that I'm going to have so many descendants that I look up at the stars and they, they will be the same type of, of numbers. And he says, well, this is what I want you to do, Abraham. He started at verse 9, and he gave instructions for creating a, a uh, sacrifice, right? And we're going to drop down to verse 12 now. And when the sun had gone down, a deep sleep fell on Abraham, and lo, a horror of a darkness fell upon him. And now he's, now he's actually in a deep sleep, and he's having a dream. Do you all see this? And so, and, and at this point, this is when the father and probably the son both walk through, walk through the pieces. And there's a whole long explanation about walking through the pieces because Abraham was fulfilling, was, was making a covenant with 
the Father, but the fulfillment was being done by the Messiah himself. So he was the one that was actually fulfilling this covenant. And he said unto Abraham, Surely know you surely that thy seed shall be strangers in the land that is not theirs, and they shall serve them, and they shall be afflicted for 400 years. This is talking about the land of Cana. We all know this, and how the Israelites would go into Egypt, and then they would eventually go into the land of Cana. And verse 15, and thou shalt go to the fathers, your father in peace. So he's telling Abraham, you're going to die, and thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the sixth, verse 16, but in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So he didn't get, really give Abraham, from what you can read here, like land at that point, but he said, your descendants are going to get it. You're living in the land, yes, but your descendants are going to get the inherit the land. But I'm not going to give it to you now because the sins of the Amorites is not full. And he says, I'm going to wait four generations. And it looks like those, this four generation thing. And it, you, we're told in scripture that sometimes you have, you have a, a curse that comes after the four generations. I think that has to do with the father giving you four generations to get your act straight. And so I think that's, that, I think that's what it's in reference to. And so did you want to make a comment? Oh, yeah, that's right. It says, fortunately, they shall come here again. Uh, right. And so this is clearly talking about, uh, I think what he's talking about here is he's giving us the, the story of Hagar, the first covenant outcome, which is they're going to go, they went into Egypt. I mean, we know this sort of thing happens again, but they went into Egypt. They were there, you know, uh, 400 years. I think 430 from the time Abram got this, this vision or promise. Uh, and then they came back. He's saying that in that generation, they shall come here again. Uh, you know, so that's all I wanted to point out here is that, well, that here again is when they went back into the land and they took, you know, they took it from the Canaanites. Right. So um, it, it indicated, it just indicates where Abram was when he had this vision. And that, that's all the only point I was trying to make there was, um, you know, is that it, it necessarily means that when he says he took him abroad, it was somewhere other than where the first covenant land was at, because he was that's where he was at when the vision happened. That's right. what I wanted to point out. Okay, great. So, verse 17 and it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoky furnace and a burning lamp passed between those pieces. Now, that's two elements. So that's why we believe it was probably the father, you know, and the son that both walked through that covenant, right through that sacrifice, you know, and fulfilled it. All right, verse 15, verse 18, I mean, 15, verse 18. And at the day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying, unto thy seed have, have I given this land. So the land that he was in, which was the land of Cana, he said, I'm going to give it to your seed. He didn't say, I'm going to give it to you, Abraham, but I'm going to give it to your seed. Now, notice that uh, from the river in Egypt and to the great rivers and then the rivers you, Euphrates. So he was going to, he was even telling him at that point, yeah, you're going to inherit, your seed is going to inherit this land. And that's where the scripture comes back and says, I'm going to plant in the east and I'm going to reap in the West. Do y'all see that? And so um, let's go on here. Now, this is why these people, when they were writing in the New Testament, came back and explained more detail here. And, and this is that verse in Acts 7, verse 5. And, it, and he gave them none inheritance in it. He's talking about, and he gave him none inheritance in it. The Abraham didn't get an inheritance in the land. He he never had. He only went and bought the land from Sarah, which we're gonna for Sarah's burial, which we're gonna talk about. No, not so much as to set his foot on it. So this is a different land. 
that he doesn't set his foot on. So the land that Abraham that Abraham was looking for, and we're going to prove that to you, had to be America. I'm going to prove it to you. Now, I'm going to show you the scriptures that actually say it. And it says, he gave him not inheritance in it, no, not such, so much as to set his foot on it. He set his foot on the land of Cana. So he's not talking about that land. Now, everybody says, well, he's talking about in the future when the millennium gets here. Well, if that's the case and they're going to set it up in Jerusalem, Abraham set his feet on that land also. Do y'all understand that? So he's yeah. talking about specifically about a different place that Abraham never put his foot on. I mean, it's no other way you can read that. It's it's easy to hey, see. Linda, mm -hmm. Linda we, did you have verse four by chance? Well, let me. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna speak to it because it, it it absolutely just definitively says so in verse four the way you're understanding this. And it says, then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Quran from and from thence when his father was dead, talking about Abraham, okay. Uh, he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. So he says in verse four, before he says that he never gave, uh, received that inheritance, didn't even set his foot on it, um, which which tells me, uh, you know, I think he's actually trying to say that Stephen was saying that to to get us to think, well, how did Abraham see it if he never stepped foot on it? And that's that's where you start going to well it's probably like he did with the prophets where he take them up by the spirit and show them a vision and yep. so it's it's amazing how like he intentionally sets you he puts you in that direction to start thinking that way it's like because that's a question you would want to ask yourself like well if you never stepped foot on it then how did he even know it or see it or you know to, to know what to look for and so anyways uh that was just a little side note but he says right in verse four that Abraham removed his father. When his father died, he brought his body and buried him in this land where we're, we're now at having this discussion. That's in verse four. So right. Right. Exactly. that proves that right. Acts 5, uh, 7, 5 cannot be talking about the Middle East. It can't be. No, it's not. So, it, it, and it's going to, there's more proof. So let's just go through it here. Now, uh, Genesis 23 verse 3 and Abraham stood up before his dead his before his death and spake to the sons of Heth now Heth would have been the oldest son of Ham saying and so this they would make an agreement he's going to make an agreement with the oldest son of Ham verse 4 and I'm a stranger and a sojourner with you so he's considering himself just a a, a foreigner in the land and give me a possession of a burial place with you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. He's talking about Sarah who had just passed away and he wanted to buy some land so he could bury Sarah. Does everybody see that? And he said, I'm just a sojourner. I'm a stranger in your land. And the children of Heth answered Abraham. Now watch what he said here. Verse 6, hear you, O Yah, thou art a mighty prince among us. See, everybody misses that because Abraham's father inherited from Ephaxat. So you had you had the children of, of Shem. We know that in history, and y'all can go back and read the World Compendium if you want, but in world history, it tells you that Shem was the ruler of the world. First, it was Noah, and then that got passed to Shem. It was more than that Abraham was more than a patriarch. He was more than a patriarch. See, once his brothers passed away and his father passed away, that, that baton or that torch got passed to Abraham. Now, these men are going to tell you that he is a mighty prince among us. Do y'all see that? So they didn't, weren't just, you know, blowing smoke up his pants leg. 
He was an actual prince. Do y'all understand that? He didn't have a kingship there, but he they knew he was from the line of Shem. They knew that line came through a fat sad and that, and that Abraham was the, the last descendant in that family. So he was he was the one that actually was the patriarch or considered the world leader. See, this this um Melchizedek is bigger than what most people think. Melchizedek was not just, you know, somebody that sacrificed uh, you know, sacrifices. That That's not who he was. He was coming from the world ruling side of the house. And scripture backs that up and right here, and history backs it up. And Barossus, who wrote in the fourth century, also brought this out, that Abraham was a, was a, uh, a prince from a royal line. All right, so interesting and his, in his choice of his scepter, buried thy dead, none of you shall withhold from the his scepter, but they may bury their dead. So Abraham uh, stood up and bowed himself toward the land and, and to the children of Heth. So he was showing reverence to them because they said, yes, we'll let you bury Sarah here. And now this is this is the whole thing. That what I read to you proves that Abraham didn't have land. He had to go buy land to bury Sarah. Do y'all see that? Abraham had to go buy land to be able to bury Sarah. If he had land in there, he could have just, you know, buried Sarah without any thought. But this is this proves that he didn't own the land. It wasn't his inheritance, it would be his children's inheritance after the Amorites had been taken care of. All right, now <clears throat> we're going to go here to Hebrews 11 verse 8. And by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he shall after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and he went out knowing whether he went. Now verse 9, by faith he sojourned into the land of promise. So that was a little that was a promised land. But even though it's a promised land, the land Cana never did take on the land of Israel as a name. You can go through scripture and see that. When Jer Jeroboam and Rehoboam split, the northern house was called the house of Israel. The southern house was called the house of Judah. Okay, so, and it designated the two peoples but not the land. The land itself in Cana was never called the land of Israel. And, and, and it's just amazing. And, and, you know, I can get off on that subject, but let's just stay. By faith, he sojourned into the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles. He was dwelling in tents for Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of him of the same promise. Now look at this verse. In verse 10, and he looked for a city which had foundations whose builder and maker is Yah. So uh, he's looking for a city. And that word, you can look it up. It, it can mean city, town, um, and it can also mean a nation. He's looking for a city. He dwelt in tents because he was looking for a city whose foundation and builder was Yah. That is the kingdom of God. Okay, so that's talking about he was looking for the kingdom of God. He That's why he stayed in tents. Do y'all see that? And so, but he, that kingdom of God, the forerunner for that was America. And so that's why it's so significant. What he's saying here is that he was really looking for this this land that we live in because that's going to be where the kingdom is set up and I'm going to prove it to you. All right, so Micah 4 verse 1, and in the last days it comes to pass that the mountain, which we know means government, of the house of God shall be established in the top of the mountains. The top of the mountains is the top of the government. We know that word mountain means government because we can go back to Revelations chapter 17 
and it talks about five have fallen, one is, and two are to come. Those are governments. Five governments had fallen. The one that was was Rome, and two more were to come. So that we understood from Ro from Revelation 17, it's talking about governments. So right here, it's telling you, in the last days it shall come to pass, that the mountain of, of the Lord, his government, is going to be set up in the top of the mountains. And guess who is at the top of the mountains? America is. She is the, she is still, even as corrupt as she is now, she is still the top of the mountain. She is the greatest nation in the world and the greatest nation that's ever existed. And that's just a fact, and you can't get around it no way. And it shall be exalted above the hills, that's smaller governments, and people shall flow unto it. Now, even if, looking at this right now, you see that the people are flowing through that southern border like crazy. Going on, verse 2, and many nations, now this gets into more detail, and many nations shall come and say, let us go up into the mountain of the Lord, Yah. So this is a, more of a futuristic verse here. This is more futuristic. And to the house of the of God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and he will walk in his paths, for the law shall go forth out of Zion and the word of of the Lord from Jerusalem. Meaning, this place, which is the top of the mountains, is also Jerusalem. It, it, you can't get around these verses because we are the nation at the end time that's at the top of the mountains. You can't get around it. Abraham must have seen this. All right, going on verse three, and he shall judge. So the judgment's going to come out from this nation and he will judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off and shall beat their swords. And then you know the rest of this, beat their swords and the plowshares and their spears and the pruning hooks and the nations shall not live up sword against nation anymore and so that's basically telling you about what's going to happen in the millennium that but what people don't get is it's telling you right here that the government seat is going to be in america she's going to be the one that's judging the large amounts of people and she's going to be the where the father sets up his government so when you go back and read what we just read in Hebrews 11, and he says, Abraham was looking for a city. He must have known that this was going to happen because the father showed him in the sky. Uh, he said, this is the way your descendants are going to be. They're going to be a huge, huge number of people. And we are the largest Israelite country on the face of the earth with 360 million people. And so that's how you know. Now going on here, Micah 4, verse 8, <clears throat> and now, O tower of the flock, that's his people, his believers, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion. So we're the, the stronghold, because if we weren't here, he said he would have burned it down to the ground, <clears throat> like Sodom and Gomorrah. And unto thee shall come the first dominion. The very first dominion comes here. The kingdom shall come to the daughter descendants of Jerusalem, not Jerusalem in the Middle East, the descendants of Jerusalem. That's why it says you reap in the East. I mean, you plant in the East and you're going to reap in the West. The harvest comes here. And Ephraim, who this nation is playing the role of, it says Ephraim is my firstborn. So we have to be the first ones that come on the line. And, and we're going to be the first ones to be punished. You can actually see that that was set up way back then when they had the 13 colonies. So let's, can we go out? Can we go on now at uh, verse 13? This is Hebrews 11, verse 13. Um, These all died in faith, not receiving the promises, more than one promises, okay? Ha but having seen them afar off. So in other words, 
they either had a vision where they saw it for off. Do y'all see what this is saying? Having seen them a far off. And so they, they must have had a vision seeing some of the promises that, that the father had given to Abraham and some of the other people too that are mentioned here and were persuaded of them, embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the land. They, we're just foreigners living here. That's what they were saying. We're just foreigners living here. Going on, verse 14. And they that say such things declare plainly that they seek to what? A country. What did they seek? They seek a country. And I'm not going to give you two chances on this one. There's only one country they would be seeking for. And that's this one. And verse 15, and truly, if they had been mindful of that country whence they came out of, they might have had the opportunity to return. Now, verse 16, but now they desire a better country, that is a heavenly, therefore, the Father is not ashamed to call them their God, and he right, and he prepared and he prepared for them a city. Now that is talking about the kingdom of God. Yes, I do understand that that's talking about a country, uh, a kingdom of God. But it's saying that a kingdom of God is a country. Now, when you read scripture, it tells you that the people will come from the north, the south, the east, and west to come into the kingdom. And that's what it says. So it's a physical place on the face of the earth. And right here it says, he called them their God and he prepared them for a city. The city and the country, do y'all see, he's using simultaneously. Adam, do you want to make any comments? Uh, I've got a brand new one to make. <laughs> <laughs> you want to wait? discovered or... it literally. No, because I want it while well, it's still relevant to this this uh, slide. So that word country, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to dig down into this. I'm not, you know, of course it means a native country, a fatherland, which I also I've always thought was interesting because the land that uh, of God is called the fatherland, and the antithesis of that, uh, Russia calls theirs motherland. I just thought that was interesting, but that's not what I wanted to share. What I wanted to share was even more interesting than that. When you drill down to the Greek um, root word for, for the word there for country, uh, the, the root word is G3902. And I, one of the definitions, it says this, marked with a sign. So it's something that's marked with a sign. And immediately what came to mind for me was the Aleph that literally is being in, uh, uh, written over this nation with what? Signs. Signs from the sky. So like it literally says the root word for that word country is, is a place that's marked with a sign. It's labeled, basically. And, and so that's something unique to America that come April 8th. We're gonna, he's going to finish uh, writing out that, that letter Aleph, which, of course, we've talked about before, means bull, um, and, it, and it's very much so coincides with Ephraim. The, um, the sign that you're speaking of is a, is a partial cross. I realize what you're saying about the Hebrew letter, but the, um, in my opinion, the first thing that come to mind when you know, I heard you say that is the sign, which is the crossed arms of Jacob Israel, which we also see in that eclipse seven years apart as well. But that symbol of the crossed arms of Jacob Israel going back to Genesis 48 is implicable, implicably the beginning sign of this nation, in my opinion. And, and to your point, it will go to the, uh, the end of this nation as well. The Confederate yeah, flag the is what I'm yeah. talking about. Yeah, the Confederate flag, yeah. Let me explain it. There's not just the crossed arms of Jacob Israel. There is also the 13 stars representing one each of the 13 tribes of Israel, Joseph having a double portion. Yeah, and right, there's exactly. a, I think it, if you're going to go that direction with it, there's another explanation, and that's that um, the Union Jack sign, which has both 
the Scottish flag and the the Christian cross. The Christian cross, which is, is which makes the X, and then you have the uh, the the crossing of the arms, which came from Britain. So they put those two together to form the the uh, Union Jack, which is the first letter of the Hebrew al alphabet, the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, brought together on a sign. And that sign is telling you uh, really Alpha and Omega, which is the word. J Jacob, excuse me, uh, Jack is short for what? Jack is short for, for, for uh, Jacob. Jacob, that's right. Jacob. It is the number one nickname yeah. for Jacob. And also James. Hmm. James is the English version of, of Jacob. Yep. Okay, so interesting. So, Thank you for bringing that up, yeah. all, both of you. Now, I, I think that's probably my last slide. It is. Um, I just wanted to comment. You don't have to go back because you don't have this on the screen. But, you know, the, the way ultimately, the, in my opinion, the most definitive way we can say America is the scripture in mind on all these things that you are showing is, again, Ezekiel 47. It's the fact that I can go into Ezekiel 47 and read off the borders that where it, it, number one, it plainly says there in verse 13 that Joseph receives two land portions, one and then the other. It says it very clearly there, unambiguous, there's two. Okay, and then it goes into describing the borders of the second one. How do I know it's the borders of the second one? Because it fits perfectly like a glove with America. And there's no way around this. Like it gives descriptions, geographic features that are non-existent in the Middle East, period. It's, that's all it comes down to. It describes a place that only America fulfills. And there's no way around that. In my opinion, there's not. Like, where are you going to find another place that has a large river that runs down and dumps into a great sea with a water of strife where it's like a dividing line of muddy waters and blue uh, salt waters? And, and the area, no less, is called by the name that's in the scripture, Kadesh, and it describes the place that perf fits perfectly New Orleans. And, you know, and all the other things, right? And I guess what I'm trying to get at here is that at the end of the day, we actually have smoking gun proof that the scriptures speak of a, a place geographically that only America fulfills in this world. And so, I, I, you know, all the other stuff set aside, you have that at least. And so I just you think know, it's and, interesting because yeah. I believe that you know, the father had to either explain to Abraham because, you know, because of that verse that said he saw our time and he and he said and he was glad. And I know they relate that to the time at that point. But I think it was something that the father showed in a vision what was going to happen with Israel throughout her history. And so I think he definitely did talk about America because he kept saying, he was looking for a country. He was looking for a country. So how interesting is that? And it says they never took possession or set foot on. So it's just interesting verses. I think it's not a hard stretch to make this connection. So people can make the connection also that when it talked about Abraham, would receive a country. He was looking for a country that that could be the new heaven and earth that comes down. And, and I can actually see that as part of that scripture, how it's being interpreted, right? That that's actually a meaning. One of the meanings for, for that is that it would be a new heaven and new earth, but a new heaven and new earth is not the same thing as a country. He was promised a country and that's what we need to read it with that understanding. For more information about this broadcast, 
please visit our website at www.12tribehistory.com. That is the number 12, tribehistory.com, or email us at lwatson44 at cox.net with any questions or comments.